Good afternoon, everybody. It's really, really good to be with you. It feels a privilege to be with you for so many reasons. Privilege to see uh, people uh, being open to God, wanting the very best, wanting more from God's spirit. People being honest about what's going on in their lives. Us having that reality check that when we ask for the spirit in our lives, that uh, it has to be matched with the way that we live our lives, as, as Paul told us. And, and the call to... To have the, the, having the spirit in our life makes a difference in a whole range of things. So, uh, yeah, love what Paul and Ian has brought, and and what we heard from Compassion too. I'm a, I'm a Compassion supporter too, and uh, have been for 12 years with a with a little guy called Milath, who's not little anymore. So great to hear what what they're doing. Great to be part of all of this. Huge privilege. And I also feel privileged because Nick also, like Ian, asked me to speak two years ago, but unlike Ian, he hasn't changed the subject. He has given me to speak on, or at least I haven't checked my emails today. So as of yesterday, he hasn't changed the subject, and the subject he gave me is there on the screens for you, on mission with the Holy Spirit, in our workplace or workplaces, friendships and families. Uh, As as Nick has said, my name's Ken Benjamin, if that's hard to remember. um, I was a pastor in a church for 24 years before doing this role now um, for an organization called LICC, which, as you know, is the Leicester Institute for Contemporary <laughs> Christianity, London Institute for Contemporary Christianity, but don't be put off by, by that name. But anyway, in my church on the South Coast, they would make play of the fact that my name's rhymed. So you can do that if you want. I'm Ken Ben. I'll respond to that. I won't mind which way around you say it. It's all good. But they were being very kind to me in my church, in fact, because my middle name is, in fact, Leonard. So I really am Ken Len Ben, which was, guys, the only joke my dad ever made in his entire life. Wouldn't it be good, he said, if all of his names rhymed and I wasn't around at the time he was choosing that to go, no, that's not a good idea. Nobody does that. And so now I live with that on the basis that it's generally said in a friendly way. Um, And also on social media, that wasn't taken at all. If you want to follow me, I didn't need to add any numbers after it on Twitter or Insta or anything, just at Ken Lim Ben, because nobody else has a name as ridiculous as that. <laughs> My dad was from uh, Sri Lanka, and uh, Paul knows that the reason this subject of the Holy Spirit in us is vital to me is because that is my family roots. I'm mixed race, but my, my family in Sri Lanka came to faith through a time of revival, a Holy Spirit time a revival. Somebody from the Welsh revival came to the capital of, of Sri Lanka, to Colombo, and converted one person, as far as I can tell. That one person went to, straight away, they were Sri Lankan, to my family's village in the north of Sri Lanka. My granddad converted, and pretty much the whole village converted. It was an amazing time of revival. Uh, a church was set up next door, and now that church is the biggest Pentecostal denomination in Sri Lanka, one of the biggest in South India. Amazing time. And my my father saw a whole range of things happen. Um, So, in fact, my surname, Benjamin, that name that rhymes with the other two, it came from their conversion. So they had a very Hindu name with very Hindu implications. And on the occasion that my grandfather and my dad were baptised, they just gave him a new name which they picked randomly out of the Bible. And I think I came off relatively well there. (laughs) Given some of the names they could have chosen. So I was pastoring this church and I, I began to have a burden beyond my church. I was there 24 years, but for what's going on in the UK. Overall, there's some great good news stories in the UK church. But overall, the UK church is ageing and declining. And we can't be okay with that because we carry the message of hope. And globally, you know, God will build his church and it's growing faster than ever before. But on our watch, in our place, it's not growing. And we can't be okay with that. So I began to get this burden beyond my church. And I wasn't claiming to have the answers at all. But surely one of the keys is equipping all of God's people beyond the church for wherever you find yourself, in your workplaces, your families, your friendships, your social contexts, throughout the week. And so I began to use the resources of 
the Leicester Institute for Contemporary Christianity or the Loughborough Institute for Contemporary Christianity or the London Institute, were for the whole of the UK. And then after a while, I did a role for my denomination. I was president of the Baptist Union, still conveying this message. And then LICC approached me and said, that thing you're doing for, for one denomination, will you do it across denominations? So that's the privilege that I have of doing. And what we are trying to do all the time is break down a sacred secular divide. By that, I mean the idea that some things are spiritual and some things you know, are not spiritual. And I would want to say to you, if you're giving your whole life to God, then it's all spiritual. But you know the sort of distinction, the idea that, that music doesn't matter unless it's got Christian lyrics. Well, that, that's rubbish if you're a musician and you're trying to give it to God. Or, you know, that um, sport doesn't matter unless it's the church football team. Or that food doesn't matter unless it's quiche. You know those sort of ideas. <laughs> and, and we're not saying that at all. We're saying that if you are doing whatever you do, as Colossians says, do it as though to the Lord, not to human masters, then there shouldn't be a sacred secular divide. But it does exist, really, in some churches, in some Christians. And we're here to kind of break that down and then to equip people. Now, I know because some of you have told me that you've come across the LICC before. And if you have, you may have seen these dots before. Just out of interest, so I know who I'm talking to in the room. Who's seen these, this image before? OK, so less than 10%. So, um, and if you have, I'm going to add a, a thought to it um, today for all of us. There's 100 dots on the screen. Those dots represent the UK population. And the red dots represent Christians in the UK. Six dots, that's those who identify themselves as Christians and attend church at least once a month. That's not a particularly high bar, but let's go with it. Now, we can have this view of church, that there we are together in the corner, and we, we gather together and we try and get some people to come and join us, those white dots that are nearest us. Now, that's a good thing to do. As a pastor, I was trying to do that always. But that's not where you and I are spending most of our time. Most of the time, it's more like this. We're the same number of red dots, right? But we're out and about making so many more connections with so many more people who don't yet know Jesus. So how would it be if when we're together, it's like the halftime team talk in any game of two halves, rugby or football? And we're about, um, there are others that have two halves, I'm sure, but um, they'll do. And... We're about resourcing, equipping, encouraging to get back out there in the game. And those of us who have the privilege of standing here, we should be player managers. We should be in the game too. And when we're together, we should be praying for filling with the Holy Spirit so that it then makes a difference when we're there, that we carry that spirit to wherever we find ourselves. There's a short video clip that reiterates that. I've got a new app that matters introduce me to I'm just going to trust it, Matt, and see what happens. Over a month, around 6% of the UK gather together to worship Jesus. It feels like we're too few to make a difference. But the reality is, Monday to Saturday, God has us, scattered in the world, connecting to hundreds and thousands of people. So wherever you are, Whoever you are. Whatever you do. You can make all the difference in the world. And on Sundays, when we gather together. We strengthen and empower one another. To be sent out again. For life on our front lines. So when we're together, ooh, so when we're together, we strengthen and empower one another for when, for when we're apart. And right at the end there, it used the phrase frontline because you've asked me to speak about workplace and families and uh, relationships and friendships. And I would add social places to that as well. Some of you are of retirement age, you're not doing paid work, but you're still doing work. So frontline is a helpful term. It's just saying, where is it in your week where you spend most time with people who don't yet share your faith. 
for many of you, it'd be workplace. For some of you, it'd be a place where you study. For some of you, it'd be family. For some of you, it will be a leisure place. So, so where's your front line is the question. Some of you need to get past the fact that front line is also the number one name for flea treatment for cats and dogs <laughs> in the UK. And some of you weren't thinking that, and now you are. <laughs> and I, and I apologise, but, but where is it in your week that you are having that thought, that you are um, in that sort of context? That's where we are. And that's where there is most hope. There was a, a survey which Evangelical Alliance did and some other people did um, very recently called Talking Jesus, the biggest survey of its kind, um, picking up a number of things. Um, and hidden in it is this phrase. They, don't, they didn't major on it, but I think we should, particularly if we're thinking about carrying the Holy Spirit out. They said the reach of the church, us collectively, is greatest through the normal everyday relationships of practicing Christians, relying on the general draw, encouraging people back to church, which we should do. It's a good thing to do. And don't say they're no for them, you know, invite them in and don't pre-say they're going to say no. It's a good thing to do. Relying on the general draw of the gathered church is going to be problematic. The best bridge is the individual Christian. The best bridge is you, is me. You know, there's 180 registered today. But if we make a connection, some of you make a connection with 100 people this year. Some of you make a connection with 10, 20. If we, if we made a connection with, with 55 people, which wouldn't be big, um, in, our, in the places we're out and about, customers who come to you, colleagues you work with, people in your family, people in your leisure places, people you have a conversation with, and you're being salt and light, empowered by the Holy Spirit with them, that's 10,000 people that we represent here. Do the maths. So in terms of the greatest chance of impact, it's not here, though the here is brilliant. It's all of us being equipped for, for everywhere else. And that research goes on to say that we most of us get this. So they asked how many of us think this is our responsibility. 75% of us think it's every Christian's responsibility to talk to non-Christians about Jesus Christ. But then I love the second bit of that research. Again, the research doesn't particularly join it up. It then says, who do you think is good at this? And other believers are better suited than I am to talk to non-Christians about Jesus. More than half of us. Again, there are mathematicians in the room. This cannot be right, friends. It cannot be right that more than half of the people think more than half of the rest of us are better at it than I am. So there's a lie going on there. And if you, did you say your next theme is courage? So I think we need a bit of courage here. And we need a bit of Holy Spirit courage even before next year. I think what we're saying here is that the greatest missional opportunity is weakened by the greatest missional lie. The greatest missional opportunity is where you are in your workplaces, in your leisure places, where you will be during the week. And the greatest missional lie is... Yeah, but I, I'm sort of an exception. I'm not as good as some of the other people. If, if, neither was Moses. Exactly, neither was Moses. Moses uh, John Goldingay saying, said Mo, Moses spent 40 years learning to be somebody, 40 years learning to be nobody, and then 40 years learning what God can do with somebody when they've learned to be nobody. <laughs> and, and absolutely, we then... I recognize that if we feel inadequate, that's a great starting point. We then ask for filling for, for God's, from God's spirit to do what he has called us to do, to be who he has called us to be. And we all need that filling. Um, I was talking to a doctor who hadn't got this sacred secular divide thing. In other words, he had got a big divide in his life until he came across this kind of thinking. And he described the two times of his life like this. When I first began work at a hospital, it was as if Jesus dropped me off at the car park and picked me up when I clocked off, working without an awareness of his presence with me, around me, and in me, robbed me of the daily ability to hear his constant voice speaking through my colleagues, patients, and situations at work. And then he changed. These days, during procedures, I pray that God will protect patients 
and bring success in difficult communications with colleagues. God gently nudges me about moments I fail to be kind. He also nudges me to be kind to myself when the aforementioned procedures don't go as I hoped. There have been a few of those. Guys, I wonder whether in what we do in that sacred secular divide, whether there is another sacred secular divide to do with the Holy Spirit. In other words, whether we sometimes make, even if we get the idea that God is with us elsewhere, that we sometimes make the Holy Spirit and filling with the Holy Spirit a churchy thing. And when we think about gifts of the Spirit and thinking about being equipped by the Spirit, we make that something that happens here. You know, if I was to take his phrase and change Jesus for Spirit, when I first began work in the hospital, it was as if the Spirit dropped me off last time I was in a church service or in the car park and picked me up when I went back to church. Working without an awareness of the Spirit's presence in me and around me robbed me of the ability to hear his constant voice speaking through my colleagues, patients and situations at work. These days, I pray that the Spirit will protect patients and bring success in difficult communications and colleagues. That The Spirit will nudge me about moments I've failed to be kind. He also nudges me to be kind to myself when the aforementioned procedures don't go as I hope. There have been a few of those. I think we need to remember that we are filled here for there. Some of you are out of Anglican roots, and uh, I love some words that are sometimes used in the Anglican communion. Not always, but sometimes. Almighty God, thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we offer you our souls and bodies to be a sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. I just wonder whether we emphasize that last bit enough. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. As Paul said, we're going to offer prayer in, throughout the day and we'll offer prayer at the end of my talk as well. And that will be one of the things we offer. Send us out to your front lines in the power of the spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. I'm going to show you another short video clip that sums some of this up for me. Scarily starts with no sound, but bear with it. Should be sound by now, though. And everyone in between. Shall I go back? Let's go back. Every day, God sends us, his people, young, old, and everyone in between, out into his world, to the places we normally go, work and school, gym and shop, field and factory, to the people he's put us alongside, to do good work, that brings good to others, ministering love and grace, snuffing out injustice, and speaking truth with kindness, sharing Jesus in word and deed, to see brows unfurrow, hearts soften, wounds heal, people set free. Home, school, work, a nation changed. Day by day. So, so whatever you do, whatever you do, wherever you find yourself being sent, we are those people sent by the Spirit to do that. That uh, prayer that we had in tongues, I wonder um, whether it was just to prompt me to, to add an illustration that's to do with my family. So, again, during this time of revival, my, my dad converted, as I say, and he would go to this church, which was right next door, still there today. 
Um, in fact, we've now given the house that they were living in to the church, so it's even bigger. And um, he would go and pray, just his own pray, prayerful devotions. But, but being of, of Asian roots, even his personal prayers would be out loud. So he would be just sitting in the church, just at the front, just praying. And he would do this for two, three days in a row. And then somebody came to him and said, you know those prayers you're praying? You know they're in tongues, don't you? And he said, no, they're not. And he was quite arrogant because um, he spoke four languages. So he was just assuming that it was one of the other languages. So he goes back to pray and he realizes that it's not any of those four languages, that God's given him another language to pray. Now, I don't want to elevate tongues above any other gifts. There's very clear instructions not to do that. But I mention that because we've had this example and because maybe that gift and others, they are to edify, they are to glorify, and then they're then to equip and give courage for wherever we find ourselves. And I'm convinced my dad was a different person out there because of here, because of being filled and equipped here for there. And that's what I want for each one of us. Bezalel is an interesting example in this. Bezalel is in Exodus 31.15, uh, or 31.1 to 5 or 2. It says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I've chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Juba, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of crafts. Bezalel is one of the first people in the Bible, maybe the first, that's described as being filled with the Spirit. And when something is emphasised in the Bible, like being filled with the Spirit, it's emphasised for a number of reasons. It's emphasised because it's important, ultimately important, part of the Trinity, and we need it. Like, like Paul says, it's not a, it's not a bolt-on, it's, it's built in to what our faith is. It's not an optional extra, it's, or it shouldn't be, it's fundamental to our conversion and our living. But also, when it's emphasised, theologians would say, look at the first example, that's significant. So the first example of being filled with the Spirit is not a priest. It's not somebody doing a particularly spiritual job, although they're going to do it in a temple. It's a craftsman. It's somebody doing practical work. So it is perfectly legitimate, I would suggest, that whatever you put your hands to, your minds to, this week, to be asking for filling and equipping with the Spirit for that role. Are you with me? So wherever that role is, that's what we're asking for equipping for. Bevelo was called to design and build a place where the presence of God would dwell. You and I are called to create a workplace where God dwells too, where God is represented. And so therefore, we ask for his dwelling there too. What was really interesting to me was, uh, it's 40 years since a guy called John Stott set up our organisation, 41 or two years now, but on the 40th anniversary, um, I was asked to write a devotional book, um, which some of you have got. It's the orange book. We just put some on the chairs. There's a few free ones there. They normally cost each of those books, but I just uh, we wanted to bless you today with them. And so what I did, um, to pick up Ian's point of we should be reading the Bible, if you're not, then start with this 40-day devotional. Why not? Um, I just asked people to tell us their story of what God was doing in their life. I'd add a verse to it and a prayer. Bob's your uncle, 40-day devotional. That was my thought. And so we got loads and loads of these devotions in. It's a huge privilege to, to get them. I hope you'll be blessed uh, by reading them. If you haven't got the orange book, you can get it free on the YouVersion app and just it will come to you every day as a devotion. Get it free from us, from our website, licc.org.uk, 40 faces, 40 places, and it will drop into your email box every day if you want it that way. But what was really interesting to me was among those stories... I wasn't asking for Holy Spirit at work stories, but we got them anyway. So I just want to share some of these with you. And my prayer, along with that prayer for being filled, like the communion prayer, and along with maybe a prayer for boldness and courage, to be, have a spirit of courage among us for wherever we are, that feeling that everybody else is better, is that one or two of these stories would particularly resonate with one or two of you. 
And it will be, yeah, I want some of that. In my context, I need that. So let's have a look at this. This person works in the music industry, but they are not producing music with Christian lyrics, right? They're not producing Christian music in that sense, but they are a Christian. And so they say this, I feel the presence of God as I create the message for each project. I want to bring a sense of his spirit to the production and feel of the track. Maybe you work in a creative area. Maybe you work having to come up with ideas. Could you pray that God, by his spirit, would prompt you to be as creative as you possibly can for the benefit of the place where you work? One person who was a lecturer said this, I, in particular, I find God leading me to be especially kind to the students. <laughs> Maybe you work in a terribly difficult environment. Um, we work for the Lord, not human masters. Um, as those serving to the Lord, it also says. So maybe what you need is a fresh reminder that those people you're serving, students or whatever it is you're serving, it's as though they were Jesus. Maybe that's what you need, a fresh reminder and filling of God's spirit with to do. This person works in uh, adoption and fostering. It's wonderful when I'm looking to match children with foster families and I feel God guiding me to the right people. Now, they still do all the correct procedures. Don't misunderstand. They don't just pray and then tick boxes. They're following all correct protocol, but they're sensing something of God's spirit guiding them. Guys, do you have some role where you've got to make some decisions this week? And you, you, as well as doing the job well, you want God by his spirit to guide you. Is that something we could be praying for some of you? This person, it's really interesting, this person, you know, like lo loads and loads of cars these days, they're just bought online and then the car gets delivered. This person's job is just to go to the different car dealers and get to know the car dealers and then deliver a car from one place to another. So she's talking about a different car dealer here who she meets. <clears throat> she's known before. This person's known they're a Christian. A woman had dropped three rings and she couldn't find them. So I told her, God knows where everything is. And I pray for him to show us where they'd fallen. Immediately after praying out loud, we found them. That sounds like God by his spirit at work to me. Um, some of you have got a, another free book um, called The One About. There's one in there about... Um, somebody who prays over a safe that won't open in a hotel and God opens that safe. That's going to speak, isn't it, to your friends and to your colleagues if we've got enough boldness um, to do it, surely. I sometimes feel God's nudge when in a conversation with a colleague a non-work issue might come up over lunch, for example, with an opportunity to offer prayer and gently debunk misinformation about God. That sounds like a gift of wisdom or teaching or discernment. You know, those gifts in the spirit, the ones that are mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, Romans 12, I believe in all of them, but we're not given tight definitions of most of them. And my appeal to you is don't give such a narrow definition of them that they're only churchy. They're only about gathered church. Surely we need a gift of teaching that applies out there. We need a gift of wisdom that applies out there, a gift of prophecy that applies out there. Maybe we practice here so that we're better at it there. Maybe we're safer here to have a go. This is the training ground, surely, and our God is ultimately forgiving. This person was in my church, and uh, they were a pharmacist. And one day, about six years ago, they came to us and said, I've got this great new promotion. Uh, it, it's not really going to cost me any time, but I get more money. What it is, is if ever there's a big infectious disease in the hospital or nationally, I'm in charge. <laughs> we said, great, and we prayed for her and commissioned her because we think one job isn't more spiritual than another. So just as we would pray for a new job in 
a church role, we'd pray for somebody getting a job like this. And then she's in charge of COVID in the hospital. And, you know, as daunting as that is, and it was overwhelming at times, but there are times, she says, but there have been moments when I've prayed for peace or insight into a situation or wisdom on what to do next or just for the energy to go again. I think that's some of us here. Just the energy to go again. Just to be able to, you know, it is the spirit of God that can give you just enough strength to put one foot in front of another. That's no less spiritual than flying on wings like eagles. It is to, is, is to walk and not grow and not faint. It's still God with us, right? So you may need that and ha have truly felt God's presence and an injection of energy to face the next situation. So maybe you've got a particularly difficult thing going on in your workplace, and that's what you're praying for. Um, and then this is this person. I love this. This person is not teaching RE, right? They're a high school teacher, but they are teaching English. And they still say this. There are times, this is in Manchester, by the way, there are times in the classroom that feel like the Holy Spirit is doing something special. Occasionally, there's a particular weight to the silence after a poem is read or someone shares a story. Everyone in the room is somehow beautifully gathered in a shared moment. And the atmosphere feels both thick and fragile at the time. These moments feel sacred to me, holy even. So you could be doing a job that doesn't have a so-called Christian label. We're trying to break down that sacred secular divide and then say, oh yeah, but there can still be moments when you sense the Holy Spirit is working over and above what you're doing. You give your best and then you pray for more than the sum of the parts because the Holy Spirit is there with you. I'd like you to just to turn to the people that you find yourself with and uh, I won't reiterate them. Did any of those jump out at you or was it the boldness courage thing? Or, or was it just a fresh feeling of here for there that you think is going to be for you when we wrap up? I've got more to say before we conclude, but I'd, I'd like you to just turn and sum up where you're at so far with the people that you're with. So the, turn to the people you're with, unless they don't look that inspiring, then sit <laughs> and go somewhere else and talk to someone else, and I'll call you back in a couple of minutes. Before we end, I'd love us to have the opportunity uh, when we are worshipping to, to, to either turn to the people we're with or to come to the prayer ministry team and ask for prayer. Um, as far as I can read it, the, the prayers that ask for filling with God's spirit, that, that ask for a fresh touch of God's spirit, they're almost always prince, present continuous tense. It's, it's not like a one-off thing. It's, it's an ongoing thing that we need. So the fact that we've prayed this already and we've sung it already it's something that we go on doing and go on needing. The emphasis this time is about here for there, but it matches everything we've said so far. So if you, you want a prayer for something that Paul or Ian have brought, there's no chop trumps in this. I won't mind. It will be um, that we all need this and we all need a fresh equipping for where we are. Um, I want to just add one thing, though, um, which is to show you this drawing, which is, OK, so... So I'm up for it. I'm up for being a representative of Jesus out there. What does that look like? Now, we've got a whole course that does this. And um, as well as our free resources, um, do sign up to our mailing. We drop a Monday email from God's Word and a Friday email from something from contemporary culture um, every week um, to try to equip people. 15,000, 20,000 people read that um, every week. Um, have a look at it. Um, get information about our resources. Um, love for you to do that but um one of the questions is okay so so i'm up for doing this christianity thing up for trying to be a better representative be better salt and light being filled with the spirit to do that what does it look like we would say based on our research it, it looks like six m's it looks like modeling godly character love joy peace patience kindness gentleness faithfulness self-control it looks like making good work. You know, Bezalel, making good work. 
When I think of making good work, I think of shaker furniture, actually. Shaker furniture is still trendy, isn't it? Um, you can get your fitted kitchen made in shaker style. It's not real shaker. The shaker's never made fitted kitchens. But it, I, do, I do know that if you want to go to an antique shop and buy, buy something that's genuine shaker, I don't know a lot about antiques, but I know that if you want to know if it's genuine shaker, you look at a piece of the furniture that nobody's going to see. So you pull out the back of the drawer. And if it's real shaker, the back of the drawer will be made as well as the front. Why is that? Because the original shakers were believers. And their attitude was God sees that work. God sees that. So I want to make good work. Then it's ministering love and grace. We are people who are salt and light, who make the place better by ministering love and grace. And then it's by moulding the culture for better. And, and then sometimes even before we tell other people about Jesus, it's just standing up for truth, being a mouthpiece for truth and justice. Those three, four, five, they're very like what Paul brought about us being a whole person of integrity. And then we are also messengers of the gospel. Now, some people will want, want to say, I'm up for all the first five, but not the sixth. And some people will say, I can do the sixth, but don't ask me to do the other five. The sixth is most important. I'd want to say it's all sort of night, friends. It's all representing Jesus. I'd want to say that six is made stronger by the other five. And the other five, we are selling it short if we don't do the sixth when we're called to do it. And I'd want to say that we need the Holy Spirit in all of those six. So maybe one of those is what you need. So when we gather, we look at how our prayers and our message and our illustration, and our words and our worship and our ministry and our testimony, the things that we use, are the half-time team talk here for there. I'm going to give you an example of that as we close. I want to give one plug or two, a prayer, and then invite the band back up. Just to say, I've been working on this for three and a bit years, three and a half years with LICC, and I have a resource coming out and a book in May um, called Vital Signs. What are the vital signs of a church that get this? Whole life discipleship affects the whole life of the church. So we've got an online assessment tool and a book and so on. Look out for that in May if that interests you. And we have a Facebook group just for church leaders. If you're a church leader here, um, and that means any role of leadership, so you're a home group leader, worship leader, deacon, elder, PCC member, pastor, vicar, any sort of leader, then there's about 900 in it so far. It's been going a year. We just try and encourage one another in the bit of ministry that you don't see. You know, we are training for a game that we don't see, how people are doing as disciples out there. We try and give each other resources, ideas, share questions. Um, join that group if that's for you. If you're willing and able, would you stand with me as we pray? And um, would a band come and join me? And I just want to reiterate those words from from that prayer, from Anglican Communion, the bit at the end, that just gets said sometimes, or maybe that's me, and I don't take it seriously. So shortly we'll go from here. We're not kicking you out, but when we do, send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. And then I just asked if the band could re- play for us and we would sing together one of the songs that we sung which is the song we are here for you and when we do that um, I'm going to trust that some of us are, are, are singing it some of us are coming for the ministry team to pray and we'd love to pray for you a fresh filling of what's going on or you're praying for the people that you're with and they're praying for any of the things that grabbed you when I asked for that two minute conversation but I'm also asking this, when we sing this song, where is here? We are here for you. When we sing it normally, we mean here. And of course, that's how the song was written. But can I invite you to picture a different here? Can I invite you to picture your front line, your workplace, your family, your leisure place? And then when you sing that, sing, we are here for you. If you're only singing we are here for you in your church building, you're selling the gospel short. 
aren't you? Aren't I? We are here for you. And, and then it says, we welcome you with praise. Can we imagine that we're welcoming the Holy Spirit with praise to our front line? We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. What place? Your desk, you work from home, the tennis club, the golf course, as Ian has mentioned, your neighbours, your road. We welcome you in this place, almighty God of love. So we'll sing. You can come to the front. Please do for prayer as we're singing. We'll trust that others are singing. You turn to both of you with for prayer. And those of us that are singing, we are flipping this song to picture different places, different hears. Let's go for it.